Okay, Sean, so that's quite a score. And uh, thanks so much for uh, sending me your screen capture and your mock-up. It really did help to clarify uh, a few things that I was um, sort of wrestling with uh, that, I, that were not clear to me. So, yeah, um, I'm actually going to start this, <laughs> this evaluation backwards because there are a lot of things that are really fresh in my mind after reviewing your score, and I'd really like to talk about the second screen first, and then we'll jump back to the first screen and I will give you some feedback on it. Um, there are some dynamics here that are kind of dropping off the page. Let me see if I can grab them. There we go. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> let's start off um, with a couple of little basic things that I, you know, those sort of things that were sticking in my mind. Um, one of them was like, here you say snare slash ratchet. So I think it would be better to have, um, see, I'm, I'm not sure, like this is the ratchet and that's the snare, right? So it would be better to have two separate lines, seriously. And, and there is room in this score. So just have a single line for the snare, a single line for the ratchet. Uh, if you really do have two notes or two two parts on the same staff, it might be better to separate them just to be really clear and maybe even mark each one like write snare above this and ratchet above that. Because like with a ratchet, yeah, like like you can't really operate both. Like the 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 um at least if you're talking about like a ratchet that has got a handle. So so that, you know, if if you're working a ratchet with a handle, then you, you know, you need one hand free to sort of turn it. And it's not really a staccato type of a thing, right? It's sort of like a... Right? So it, it has a little bit of duration to it in during which the, the ratchet turns over. Um, now, you could have like an accent on it, which means that the wrist or the, the hand motion of the percussionist will go faster, they go but I would still separate these out into two different parts. So the other thing that sort of leapt out at me were these B flats in here, right? That's actually a B natural in the original score and I think in the template. So I mean, if, if you had wanted to change things around and just like, like adjust the harmony, that's great. But just pointing out that that's not the original thing, and the other, the other thing too is that like not only is it um, not in the original score, but it but like when you are um, you're sort of really calling attention to it here by having both violin groups play the B flat um, against everything else, you know, which sets up a um, a diminished fifth and so on. And yet, you know, when you consider that that there is a B natural in other parts, then we also have kind of a, that conflict as well, right? So, anyways, just watch out for that. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> to discuss this, uh, um, you, know, you are really like bringing out your parts um, very prominently against the strings like I hear you have piano marked and yet you have accented staccato right so I, I mean it's yes I mean there is there are accented staccato piano parts that you know that that where that that's the intention but I feel like you're basically just importing the um you're importing the uh, the articulation style um, without really adjusting what that means, right, in this context. The accented staccato, it really applies to the melody, right, R rather than just all of the accompanying voices. <clears throat> if you look at the C-sharp um, and so on, and, and E and D in the original piano part, um, like that, that does not have the articulation applied to it. Okay, um, yeah, and, and since this is a background element, right? However, um, 
you know, maybe the mix was kind of high on your strings or something and you brought them way down. Generally, in a section like this, the strings would be mezzo forte at, at least, right? And, you know, if you wanted these to stand out, they would then, then the foreground voice would have no problem. There are a couple of notes sort of missing from this, right? It's, uh, you are coming in um, with where this is scored in the right-hand staff, but you're kind of missing the fact that the figure starts off E, F, G, and then it goes to this, right? So, ba 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 da 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 It's a full bar phrase. Um... <clears throat> yeah, but I mean, it's 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 nice and effective. You're you're keeping the mel the melodic statement really simple here. Uh, did you consider possibly going to bass clarinet here, right, to just get a get a more intense woody sound, right? Um, and then maybe going to English horn here, just to sort of change things around, uh, and and not get stuck in one particular timbre or one particular part for too long. This is all really fun right in here. And, you know, the, there's kind of a general lack of dynamic markings, you know, p past this piano. Like, what are you going crescendo to, right? Is this still piano all the way through? Um, so in that case, you know, if you really are determined that the, that the string should be so much softer than everybody else, then I would say mark them, mark it uh, piano sempre, right? So that we really know that this is going to last the whole thing. But then you're really kind of at odds at that with these articulations that are really intended for a louder, um, a louder kind of dynamic. And you know the sforzando going on here and the double basses, this kind of trade off between pizzicato and arco, it's it's totally fine. It gets a bit fussy after a while, but still. Yeah, and, and this has showed up in other parts of, you know, having the cello really leap up to that G-sharp and come back. That's all pretty playable, but I would say have some mercy on your cellist and write this in uh, tenor clef, I would say. That kind of works better. <clears throat> all right, so yeah, just the problem is that, like, when you add the horn in here, finally, at forte, and you've got these parts still so soft, right? You know, you, this crescendo to what? Mezzo piano, right? And then you got this really strong, it just really takes over everything. What the mock-up is telling you here is totally true, right? And what's the dynamic for these parts? Like, how is, uh, this is a little strange. You've got the, um, you've got these, um, you got these ties kind of upside down. Uh, maybe that was from uh, copy pasting from my score, so um, I could, you know. Anyway, so just watch out for that. Yeah, so just really have to tell us, you know, what the dynamic is. Um, this stuff in the background here is nice. You know, what if your background, uh, what if your background dynamic was mezzo forte, and your foreground was forte? Right, that that you know, I just feel that some of this needs to be a little stronger. Of course, this can't be too strong, or else it really adds a lot of inertia to the part. I mean, I, I can see why you're trying to keep things in the background, but then it's just kind of you're you're working against that with all these accents, right? Okay, so um, applying <laughs> our. Um, Uh, our principles to this, our criteria for evaluation, contrast of color, breadth of texture. Um, yeah, I mean, you don't really, you, you kind of stay within the bounds. Occasionally you have a few high notes here, but they don't really pull apart on the texture. I think it's nice that you're adding some brass right in here. That's cool, but once again, I mean, I just feel that that means that the string should be a little louder. I think that this should all be marked staccato right in here, um, right? I mean, you've got the staccato here. I think that the, that there should be staccato here as well. <clears throat> you know, just it, it is in the uh, in the original 
uh, piano part. So I would say add it to the add it to this part as well, to the cello part as well. Um, then maintaining differentiated roles and close spaded, closely spaced melodies, overlapping accompaniment figures, highlighting inner voices. I mean, the highlighting of the inner voices is kind of hard when the dynamics are so much softer, right? There's that, ba -ba -da -ba -de -de -ba -bum, which I, uh, I'm kind of concerned about. Um, and you don't really bring that out very much. Um, right it's it's kind of you kind of left it out um it's i mean it's sort of audible but it it like the parts you know those that that sinking line isn't really um it, it doesn't really have its own quarter notes do you know what i mean like they it's it's eighth notes in the part but obviously because of the pedal that's being used they they last for longer than that right <clears throat> um, there are the high interjecting notes um, with softer strings. That's not a problem. There um, and then, but then you know the whole question of the triplets overwhelming the melodic line, right? It's 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 kind of hard. Uh, you know, right here you've got your melodic line in octaves in the strings, and because they're so much softer, right? It the the horns just you know, the triplets from the horns just walk all over them, right? So you just have to think about that a little bit more um, in terms of proportioning that. But, I mean, it's it's not bad scoring, don't get me wrong. It's just, just adjusting the dynamics a little bit, I think, would it would be the best bet. The widely reaching left-hand patterns, I think that you score those fine. There are a few open strings that you can uh, you can take advantage of, like this open G and so on. Uh, so that makes it not too hard, but maybe in certain situations you can divide things up between double basses and cellos uh, in situations like this and just um, make things even easier on everybody. Then, um, yeah, textural contours, uh, keeping them fresh, I think that would be another thing that I would work on with you if we were, like, if we were preparing this for, say, a um, like a pro professional performance, I would say, like, is there any variety that you can bring into this? You know, can you vary the tone color? Can you um, have groups of instruments uh, conversing with each other? Can you um, change up the melody and so on, right? So it's just adding more to what's available. Um, I mean, especially considering how dynamic uh, the parts are on either side of this, the C part and the and the A part, right? So speaking of which, let's jump back to the A section. And here we've got what I feel is is a is a great feature. Like, you know, like you are leaving the um, the grace notes to the snare drum and you're just letting everybody else just hit it right on the head. So ba 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 da 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 and that's really really cool. Um, so let's apply the criteria to this as well, right? Okay, so pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano, um, that's not the biggest concern. You have some lower pitches here, double bass, uh, things get expansive right in here. We've got the chimpani blasting along on that low B. So, uh, so that isn't as much of a worry. Thematic material repeating often, sounding repetitive with the same exact treatment all the way through. Well, um, I mean, that is something that you fell into here. So I would say, like, if you're going to keep working on this, or if you're going to be approaching material that is very similar to this, then try to do things like magnifying the second time, right? Or changing something about it so that it sounds fresh again, right? Um, then melodic development soaring quite high. You don't worry, you don't have a worry about that because you are keeping things 
um, in a lower octave to begin with, and then you are very judiciously adding flute uh, and and piccolo and so on that can cope with some of those jumps up, right? Now, it, it's a little strange, though, the way that you've got this um, this clarinet just sort of pooping out right here, right? So, like, the clarinet coming in and then dropping out, that lack of continuity in the texture will be heard, right? So I, th I think what you're doing, you're thinking right here is, oh, well, since this is A2 on the lower voice, when the second flute, I, I'm, I'm assuming that this is A2 flute, or it's right in here, that didn't get written in. Um, when I go to A2 flutes here, then the clarinets can just, like, stay, stay out. But um, any decent clarinet player could run up to that high written F sharp and uh, and not have a big problem, right? So, yeah, and, and it's also a little unclear whether or not this is meant to be A2 or, or just a single clarinet, like maybe the first clarinet player. Um, yeah, so, yeah, see, like here, sometimes you're careful to mark uh, your entrances and sometimes not. So, I think that I'm going to have to make a checklist of of things that everybody should go over before turning in their entry, um, and add that to the. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to. I, you know, the the first the first time that I had an orchestration challenge, I just dropped an excerpt and said, you know, send me, you know, email your results back to me, and it's just gotten bigger and bigger. You know, this this is I don't know what if I'm going to have 200 entries next year. Um, and so I kind of have to talk about a lot of um, certain things that, so that it doesn't bog down the evaluation process itself. And I apologize for that, but yeah. But I would say that would be one of the things, you know, proofread your entrances, like things like this. Obviously, that's two players and then um, going to uh, going to what, A2 again, you know, so you would, should mark that, right? Then accompaniment figures covering a wide range. It's all totally doable. Uh, these, this is just you know a piece of cake for your uh, <clears throat> for your string players. Now I I would add a caution here about um, octave clarinets. Okay, so if you check out my uh, my orchestration course 104 uh, clarinets. Uh, is it clarinets, bassoons, and saxophones on macro video? Um, I have a video about the roles of the clarinet player in the orchestra, and you can just go watch it for free. There's, you know, I think you get five freebies a day over there, so you can preview my course. And uh, I use the example of one of the Mahler symphonies where he has like a hornpipe, uh, like a, 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 like a sailor's, uh, like a sailor's melody. And he interprets that in octave clarinets. And that is something that note performer or other, um, other kinds of sound sets do not really express. And that is how the overtones of clarinets build on each other, right? And there's a certain kind of pungency, a certain kind of spice to it uh, that that kind of doesn't come through because the instruments aren't sitting next to each other, uh, pushing at each other's overtones, right? But that is a phenomenon that is absolutely there. So I am not saying that this is wrong at all, but I'm just saying that it is going to be a lot punchier than than you think, especially at fortissimo, right? So just the the area that is the overtones that are sitting above these octaves are going to be very, very spicy. They're going to, you know, you're really going to hear like a twisting of the ear. So, you know, just as to the actual orchestration and how that all works, I think it's cool to trade off your, um, your sections, you know, strings, 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 winds, dun, dun, dun. Right, and then and I think that that's very very fun to have the two groups talking towards each other, talking to each other. 
uh, and this pounding timpani in the bottom. You know, it's kind of cool that you're that you are playing B's instead of E's. And and then all of all of this stuff right in here. I had to add these. They weren't in your original, but they were in the um, in the the screen capture that you sent me when I was trying to sort of uh, confirm a few things. Now that is basically just doubling the same thing that is going on here in our cello line. Uh, maybe this would be a kind of a cool place to go to um, uh, pizzicato for your middle strings and uh, staccato for your lower winds right in here. Okay, and then yep, up, 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 up. Okay, so here I think you fall into a trap, right? If you look at the piano score, Faya ends on the downbeat, very, very high, and then the beginning of the next phrase is on the second beat, right? So I think by jumping in here with everything. You know, the, the timpani blastings, the tuba just shoving that note down there, big, um, you know, tutti strings and and very healthy, heavy brass right in there. I think that it it takes away from the sense of falling off, right? Right? Rather than... So I think it's it's almost like you're stomping on somebody's... Um, you know, you're stomping on somebody's feet right in here by coming in so early, right? Or st sort of stomping on the end of the phrase. Um, everything else is kind of fun right in here. Yeah, I mean, I mean, no, no big complaints. Kind of low trumpets and high trombones right in there, right? You got your C trumpets playing this E. You got your, um, you got your trombones playing as well. So you like, wouldn't it be kind of cool to have A two trumpets right here, and then, um, then this A could be played by the first trombone, right? Um, like interlocking um, trumpet and trombone parts is kind of not necessary. It's like it's a, there's a different reason why it's done in in horn parts, but uh, I think that stacking uh, pitches in trumpet and trombone is probably a better way to go, right? And and to not push the second trumpet player too low. Now now here, of course, I mean they can play low A's all day long, but it is not as beautiful a sound as that same A being played by the trombone, right? So it's a it's kind of a shallower, um, you know, little kind of unsatisfying sound. Whereas A2 trumpets on that E is way better than first trumpet and first trombone on that E together, right? Just they have a better blend and it's sort of a nice cutting sound to them. All right, and then we've got A2 trumpets below, you know, flutes and and piccolo so you've got your triple octave yep up up bum 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 and here's where I'd, i i'm thinking that like some variety would also do well like you know you have this beautiful idea of trading off in here what if there could have been some trading off here in the melody as well right i mean it, it's it's there's nothing wrong with the way that you orchestrated it really because like i like that sort of sense of directness where everybody is just kind of working together and working their way down um might be cool to go forte pianissimo here, right? And then just, uh, and then slur or tie to the next pitches. Uh, you know, rather than having this kind of idea. I, I, I think that it's it's better to get the strings out of the way immediately if you're going to have some sort of background. Because in this kind of very dancey, jumpy uh, scoring, background pads tend to slow down or sort of pull at the inertia or sort of excuse me they tend to pull at the momentum and create a sense of inertia anyway so that's what i've got to talk about in your score sean and you know just just great to get a score from you for this particular uh challenge um you know i had a feeling that this would bring out a lot of imagination, creativity, and, and inspiration from a lot 
of my entrance and uh, and I was not wrong <laughs> you know and just because I have a lot of things to say about each score doesn't mean that I think that that the scoring was bad or anything I'm just adding some some comments and some suggestions and so on there are lots of neat things in this score in particular like I really love the idea of the oboe being below the clarinet right and then trading off to the bassoon and and the bassoon taking over that's such a great idea you know it's like endless it's almost like endless double reed uh, illusion right in here because the clarinet is covering everything up by being on top yeah it's just just fun fun stuff in all of these scores things that I did not you know did not occur to me when I looked at this uh, and uh, yeah and sometimes humbling as well you know um, you know, please don't mistake my my evaluation of a score as disrespect for the person who submitted it or you know in, in any way diminishing what their you know their accomplishment um, it's more just giving feedback and looking for ways to build on craft right uh, I'm a builder I don't tear things down so uh, so thank you again Sean for this entry thank you so much for your support on on patreon every time I say that I feel it I am not just um, mindlessly reciting that off of a cue card. I'd really do uh, appreciate everything that the Patreon community is doing for this, uh, for the rest of the community at large out there uh, on the internet. Uh, people who dip into an occasional video on my channel or read a post on the website. Everybody from some, you know, people who barely know about. Uh, internet orchestration resources to people who are just completely soaking in it that we they all owe our supporters and I or owe our supporters a lot of thanks so thank you anyhow <laughs> with that I will move on to the next evaluation uh, people who have been following these evaluations know that I've been I've had some work done on my house so I, I kind of have to evaluate everybody in the morning before things get started so um, I better get to that. Uh, and thanks again, everybody, and I will see you really soon.